Well, thanks very much <clears throat> to Manish for that um, very comprehensive view. It's, you know, I, I guess my first NSF grant was 40 years ago, so it's amazing to see how cyber infrastructure has become a central uh, integrating idea for all of NSF and particularly all the large instruments and, uh, and the distributed production of data everywhere. Um, and uh, it's, it's very encouraging. I'm going to give you uh, a view of where we've come since last year um, and where we're going forward. It's an amazing difference from just one year ago. It's hard to imagine how much change has happened. Um, and I'm going to also try to give you a rough idea of the kind of talks you're going to be hearing on what topics. I'm not, it would take my whole talk just to read through the agenda, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I will try to target a few ideas uh, as they come. Now, we heard from Ender, uh, uh, from ESNet, and it's just important, I think you all know this, but it, without ESNet, uh, we wouldn't be here because the whole concept of the uh, DMZ, uh, specialized networks on campuses that are set up for high performance uh, data and not just commodity internet, was uh, coined by uh, ESNet in 2010. The idea of data transfer nodes uh, came uh, from them as well, uh, and the performance monitoring with Personar and so forth. So, so the, the whole set of notions that we pulled together uh, to be here uh, really came uh, through a really unprecedented partnership. I say unprecedented, it's unprecedented in 30 years. Uh, when the last time this happened was when the NSF decided that they wanted to set up supercomputer centers for academic research and they went and when I put in my proposal it cloned Lawrence Livermore National Labs facilities and when Sid Karen put in his it cloned the MFE, the Magnetic Fusion Energy uh, Facilities. So it was very much this transfer, and then the introduction of parallel architectures was um, uh, done with uh, NSF and uh, DOE. So D this time what happened is, as you know, uh, Kevin Thompson in particular at the NSF brought forth this uh, NSF CC STAR program, and it's over 200 universities have now uh, been awarded uh, grants over the last six years uh, on their campuses to build these DMZs. So the uh, we're going to hear more about that. I'm going to give these little red uh, call-outs to just uh, point you to talks that you may want to hear about. Uh, there'll be a big talk from Eli Dart uh, at ESNet and then a deep dive uh, on similar topics on Tuesday, um, tomorrow. So the logical next step was to hook us all together, and we, you know, these are uh, two slides that I think are uh, the same. Uh, the one from Ender is, is a different way of saying it, but cover, uh, material I covered last year. But the next logical step was to put this, these DMZs and connect them. Uh, and that's what led to the PRP grant. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that the co-PIs, Camille, uh, is here from uh, uh, Citrus. Uh, up at Berkeley. Tom DeFani uh, is somewhere around here, uh, co-PI. Uh, Phil Papadopoulos, I think you uh, came in as well as Frank. Uh, Phil's over there, good, and Frank, you're right here. Uh, so uh, an incredible uh, set of uh, co-workers. Um, but to do, to show that this was going to be useful, I knew we were going to have to not just have uh, experts in networking and computing and storage and software, but we needed the actual end users of that. And so uh, we worked to get uh, over 50 uh, application uh, users that are in multi-institutional collaborative teams already, but using the commodity internet or FedEx to send USBs around to move data from one point to another, and got them to engage as well as uh, over 30 uh, chief information officers or other top uh, um, People, people like Jerry Sheehan uh, here at Montana State, um, to formally sign letters of commitment to, to actually carry this out. Now, here's the interesting thing. This um, grant is essentially funding three FTEs. And there's 200 of you here. Now, how does that work? It's because this is 
what we're seeing in this community is one of the largest voluntary, voluntary coming together of people to work on something uh, that they think is important for the future. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, uh, activity. And our program officer, Amy Walton, who you saw her picture in Manisha's slides, has been just wonderful to work with. So where are we going from here? And this is where things begin to get different than where they were last year. So this is the map of the quilt. Jen, where are you? Yes, Jen's right here. Uh, Jen Leisure, the head of the quilt. And the reason that I start with that map is that you'll see that fundamentally the regional networks across the United States really are the organizing principles. They're the intermediate steps uh, between national systems like Internet2 and, and ESNet and the campuses. Uh, that's just the way we've organized things for 30 years in this country. And uh, so it's, I think, I personally think uh, that the regional networks are uh, central for uh, creating a, a national research platform. So we actually built the uh, uh, PRP out of this based on scenic, the large regional network in California and the Pacific Wave, Ron Johnson is here, I believe, as well as Lewis, uh, and the uh, link between the Pacific Northwest Gigapop, Scenic, and then the Front Range uh, Gigapop and Hawaii, using uh, these op dedicated optical fiber paths that uh, Scenic uh, has developed, uh, or the Pacific Research, uh, the uh, Pacific Northwest Gigapop to Chicago, uh, some of these actually come from Internet 2 uh, fibers that are reused for this, but they're dedicated to uh, researchers, not to commodity Internet. So uh, I was very excited, as uh, Anna said, to uh, having worked behind the scenes for a long time, to announce at the Internet 2 Global Summit just in May that uh, a number of the regionals uh, learn the Great Plains Network, NYSERNet, and Kinber in uh, Pennsylvania have uh, decided to come together and work with Internet2 and with Scenic to create a pilot national scale extension of the PRP um, in which we can do uh, a lot of the uh, networking measurements and the debugging of uh, this larger scale, you know, the light can only go a certain speed. That is the law. Uh, they something I worked in my early days, um, and so this is uh, being put in place. And as um, Anna said, the uh, GPN uh, Great Plains Network actually approached me a year and a half ago after the, my first talk at the Internet Two Global Summit and said they wanted to be part of this. So I'm going to show you a few examples because they've been working longer than the others, but the others are coming right on very fast. Uh, and um, you're going to hear <clears throat> about, <clears throat> there's a whole session on this NRP pilot uh, <clears throat> later today, and also on uh, scaling between the regional networks and the national networks. Uh, there's a, a, a talk on Tuesday. And Howard Pfeffer, who's here from, who's the president of Internet2, uh, has really been uh, extraordinary along with uh, Lewis Fox from Scenic at putting together uh, this very cooperative uh, enterprise. Um, it's not funded exactly, it's just people coming together to try to uh, see if we can get a, a sense of what it would be like to have a national scale version. Uh, so <clears throat> what we are doing in each of these uh, networks is putting Fiona's. Now you've heard this Flash IO network appliance many times. This came, uh, Phil Papadopoulos, who was the PI of one of those CC grants, PRISM at UCSD, it was under that grant that uh, this idea was developed. Here's five of them. Uh, they're rack mounted uh, in Cal IT2. Uh, they're typically, uh, you can have anywhere from 12 to 40 something cores, uh, large RAM, uh, SSDs, uh, uh, usually these are one, you could go a five or six, uh, two 10 gigabit interfaces up to 40, 100 gigabit interfaces, 
And because they're slots, because they're commodity PCs, you can put up to eight 32-bit uh, GPUs into them. And they're very inexpensive. That's the whole point. And they get cheaper and more powerful every year on somebody else's nickel in the commercial world. That's the beauty of working with commodity networking. But it's even more amazing is that if you just want a gigabit sustained, you can actually, for $250, and it gets getting cheaper all the time, <clears throat> have one of these things we call Fianets. And so uh, prior to this, uh, last Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, as you know, we had a three-day uh, invitation workshop, a hands-on workshop that we extended particularly to the uh, EPSCOR uh, states and the minority-serving institutions that we've partnered with for many times. It's not an accident that we're in an EPSCOR state here, uh, because uh, I remember when the VBNS came out uh, back in the late 90s, uh, and that network was uh, not in, as inclusive as it might have been, <clears throat> particularly with respect to EPSCOR, uh, and that led to some um, problems that I remember very well. And I wanted to welcome uh, Dr. Loretta Moore here, who is the new section head for EPSCOR. We're so pleased that you could join us. Uh, and she's got a, a talk uh, that as well about this. We've got several deep dives and, and talks uh, on uh, in increasing uh, the uh, participation, because we want this to be a true national research platform. So uh, this is um, a baby picture. Um, that I'm very pleased about. This is, of course, just another Fiona in a way, but uh, this is the first one uh, of our new uh, uh, partners, the regional networks, a multi-scale regional network to peer with a PRP, and this was actually um, a picture taken last May, and you can see it's the Great Plains Network, but more importantly, it's at MU, Go Tigers. Uh, <clears throat> That's where I had my undergraduate uh, experience. I grew up in Columbia, Missouri, and so to me, it's a, a wonderful uh, thing. I, I doubt that had anything to do with them choosing MU, but still. Uh, and notice that before the PRP, this was uh, uh, the going between uh, Columbia, Missouri, and Scenic uh, uh, in LA, and John Hess has been very helpful in, in making this happen in Scenic. Uh, they were getting less than a gigabit per second. Uh, then May, we got 3.7, and I just asked uh, George Robb III about this uh, yesterday, and he says they're now up to 11 gigabits a second. And this is this learning curve. I mean, it's the same Fiona, right? But there's a learning curve as you gradually figure out where there are things that need to be uh, optimized along the various paths, because the whole point about this is we're looking at disk-to-disk -disk bandwidth. That's a very hard thing to do because those Fionas are in some campus network and they go across, they, it, it may it's be worse, they're in a building that then the building, the physics department has the responsibility for networking in the building and then the campus CIO has it for the campus and then it goes over a regional or wide area network and then to another campus and then that's some other person, they do it a different way and then um, some other building, and I mean, that's insane, but that's the way our networks are put together in this country. <laughs> and so how do we get that engineering of that point to point? That's why we've had the, the really the privilege of having over dozens of the best network engineers in, in the West Coast particularly working together and have a, an hour talk every week now for three years straight to create uh, what we have in the PRP, uh, debugging all of that. And, and so there's a, and a great amount of sharing. And uh, James Deaton is going to talk more about uh, this as part of the panel uh, later. Now, this <clears throat> is the thing that has changed everything. <clears throat> I thought Mosaic uh, appearing uh, was one of the biggest changes in distributed computing software I'd ever seen, but the experience of Kubernetes is the biggest thing I've seen I, in my personal uh, since 1994, 93. Uh, and what is it? Well, it's this whole idea that software goes into containers and then you have, as we know with 
Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, there are global planetary computers, planetary data centers tied together with fiber optics. And so this software has to go all over the place, being replicated. It has to be automated. As we heard, Google does several billion of these uh, a day, uh, container uh, executions. And, and so they've got to find their way onto a computer. It's got to be completely automated. And, and so an enormous amount of effort has gone into developing this. And then Google made it open source and was decided instead of competing with all of the other companies to uh, work together. Uh, uh, and, and, and so as a result, uh, there's, it's, it's just swept like wildfire. I mean, I didn't mention Kubernetes in my talk last year. How is that possible? Since then, over 40 companies and all the cloud providers have uh, gotten behind Kubernetes. And we have made Kubernetes the uh, container orchestration engine for the entire PRP. And this is setting in place the complete change in the idea that the clouds are something different from our clusters or from supercomputers, which is the way I grew up. I've, I mean, I'm 70 this year. I mean, I, my whole life it's been like that. And now it's not. It's a watershed. It just changes everything. It, but it, 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 as they say, it gets better. Uh, the Ginza knives are coming. Uh, so we had a whole day of this uh, yesterday, a very highly technical, from my point of view, uh, I'm too old to learn this stuff, I think. but. A beautiful, beautiful work. And the people, the young people just swim. It's like fish and water in this. They, they're just totally docker and they're doing this and they're doing it. I mean, it's, it's amazing. But it's better. It's not just the execution of software. It's also distributed data. And so Rook is another open source um, file block and object store that works on Ceph, which is uh, 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 object... Uh, um, version for distributed software, distributed data that is um, uh, very widely used, came out of UC Santa Cruz. Um, and again, this was covered in detail yesterday. So what this has allowed us to do is, as we've taken, you see all these different uh, universities that are part of the PRP, uh, all interconnected by Scenic. Um, the, we've deployed these Fiona's, we're now, uh, deploying John Graham, uh, who is, as many of you know, uh, one of our, our wizards that has made this all happen. He and Tom Defani went around in their van, uh, like Johnny Appleseed, uh, dropping disk drives in Fiona's and, and, and essentially distributing close to a petabyte of rotating storage, all interconnected at 10 to 100 gigabits a second, like it's all in one rack, other than the light travel time. Um, and all of it is under Kubernetes Rook, Ceph. And this means that you can, uh, once your software is, is, is uh, organized like that, uh, you can, it just, it just transparently moves from your computer to a supercomputer to any of the cloud providers, assuming you have, you know, accounts on them and so forth. Um, and uh, the data can also uh, be organized in the same way. So it's, it's just a huge difference. And, and notice this is $10 per terabyte per year. And, and this is deploying petabytes of data for the scientists to put their data into and make it available to collaborators on these Fiona's. But because the software is the way it is, it could also be in the cloud. It, it just It's just one big distributed computer. And we've I was uh, talking to Cliff Lynch earlier. You know, this has been the dream of distributed compute and storage and software that we've grown up with for three or four decades. And now it's actually happening. And uh, we, so this distributed data is, is so important. Uh, Dima took us all through uh, yesterday, Dima Mission from SDSC, the Kubernetes and Rook and so forth. Alex, sitting here in the front row, I'm very pleased you were able to join us again this year, uh, has, of course, been awarded uh, by NSF uh, a major distributed national 
uh, storage system, and he's going to be uh, giving a, a deep dive on that uh, uh, today. And then uh, Rob Gardner is going to talk about the scheduling of, of compute and storage across this. So the, the, I'm, my message to you is um, storage, distributed storage, is every bit as important as distributed computing. And they're all coming together. Um, and we're going to have more on that, and I'll get to that in just a second. But once you've containerized these things, you know, when we first made Fiona's, they were per sonar uh, Fiona's. They were just, it was, it was, I, at the time I thought it was kind of nutty, but uh, they said, well, yeah, we can only run per sonar on a machine that doesn't have any other software. So we actually had to make these Fiona's and put it out there with just perf sonar on it, and you couldn't put anything else on it. <laughs> Once you containerize the perf sonar or the grid FTP or anything else, you can put them on, put all this stuff on Fiona's. And so it's, it basically allows for things like these trace route tools where you can actually see the, all of the routers along the paths and, and um, where like this is orig you know, uh, originating in Riverside and shows all the other things. And then I'm s zooming out and that's probably uh, Kisti up there at the top in Korea. Um, uh, this is these things are live. They're 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 just like I mean <laughs> you just grab them and they move around. Uh, it's extraordinary. And and of course our mad dashes uh, not only show the throughput, but also uh, once we've containerized the sonar, are able to do the number of paths, the packet losses between any of the endpoints across the, the network. So uh, very powerful. And the quilt, of course, has jumped in. Again, Jen, I want to give a shout out to you for your leadership there in the quilt because uh, here's the quilt. This is as of, uh, let's see, two days ago. Uh, <laughs> the Mad Dash between all these different members of of the quilt, so they're adopting these technologies from the PRP, from which we adopted from the Department of Energy, ESnet, and um, are really uh, just growing and growing and growing, and both the number of people that are engaged and the uh, quality of the connections. And so, it's not just an NRP we're we're, we're talking about; it's a global one. Um, as I said, we started out uh, with the PRP with built on the scenic Pacific wave, but with Internet 2's joining us now, um, uh, we're going to be able to very rapidly, I think, build out more international partners now. As you know, Case de Lot of the Netherlands, the University of Amsterdam was uh, in the proposal for the PRP. But since then, we've added Australia, Japan, uh, Korea, KISTI, and just to give you an example, you know, it used to be that they said that long uh, haul high bandwidth TCP IP would always fall apart. But we've actually now measured between the Fiona's and KISTI uh, and, uh, uh, and UC San Diego, five gigabits per second, disk to disk, no problem. And so I think that this idea of a global research platform is quite real. We've since added Guam and Singapore. In Singapore, we have someone here uh, from Singapore as well. Uh, and, and so uh, I think you're going to see this populated, this map, uh, more and more as we go. And there's a whole uh, session on this international scale measurement and technologies uh, tomorrow. Okay, so that's the cyber infrastructure. I want to shift now to the applications. And in particular, as you know, we had... Um, uh, these were the application areas that we brought to the party that were in the PRP uh, proposal. There's a whole session following the break uh, that is going to be dealing with the science drivers uh, for the PR, for the NRP. Um, and I'm just going to take you through three classes. And rather than go into a particular, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to say these are classes of what we're seeing emerge of scientists beginning, the early days of beginning to adapt their workflow to these new capabilities. And the first one I'm going to talk about is um, what happens when you have high performance access to distributed data analysis. And there's a good reason I got Frank to be <laughs> co-PI is because uh, he's sitting next to Harvey Newman, and Harvey, of course, has been a pioneer for decades in, in this optical fiber infrastructure globally to the architecture of that uh, for the uh, 
uh, particle uh, community, the data uh, analysis community. And here you can see what you're seeing is a trace of uh, the bandwidth between a, a, a DTN sitting on, uh, in, in, I don't know, was it at the fifth floor of, of the physics building uh, at UC San Diego, to uh, Fermilab. And what that uh, yellow is circling is 30 gigabits a second. And that's sustained over time here. Um, and uh, so the real question is, well then, okay, you can now get this kind of bandwidth. That was never possible before, but what about the caches that the, the you know, the, the data comes from LHC, it goes to the tier ones at Brookhaven and, and Fermi, and then to the tier twos and tier threes and so forth uh, around the world, but in this country in particular. Well, it turns out there's two, uh, the two detectors, CMS and Atlas, of the Large Hadron Collider uh, are, are their data uh, are separately um, organized. And there are two tier two uh, CMS detector sites in Southern California, oddly enough. Uh, and that's for historical reasons, um, uh, and one of them is Harvey's group at Caltech, and the other is Frank's group at uh, San Diego. So what they're now doing is, having distributed that data, you don't want to have to move data unnecessarily, so you cache this stuff intelligently. And what you're seeing here is these traces uh, are going, this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 gigabits a second, and there's thousands of flows going back and forth between these Fionas that are at uh, San Diego and Caltech. So here, here you have, as Harvey likes to say, two uh, uh, Fionas separated by the light travel time across the Netherlands. <laughs> and they're um, uh, just, you know, talking to each other at these uh, enormous speeds um, of uh, tens of gigabits a second, uh, and they're just, you know, these, these um, provision Fionas. So this, this is a first step of then sep putting more and more of these caches in place, and that brings me to what Frank is going to be talking about, which is how do we look more generally at the open science grid, which is doing so much of the computing uh, for the uh, LHC, um, and um, uh, they have these caches that are uh, put across the uh, country, um, and they've been working on this for quite some time, but with Kubernetes, you could either grow these caches by adding servers, or you can add additional locations, and these are, you know, very important science experiments, uh, the Dark Energy Survey, the LIGO Gravitational Wave Observatory, a lot of these things are, are using this. So um, Frank uh, has, of course, been working between bringing the caching strategy of OSG together with PRP, but more recently with Internet2 again. Um, and he's got a talk uh, on Tuesday that really is going to go into a lot of detail about how this caching works and how Internet 2 coming together with Scenic and the PRP uh, 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 and the OSG as a whole, this is you know, going to be very important for the national um, uh, uh, distributed s storage. I will say that one of the things that I'm very hopeful about is that the work that um, uh, Alex is doing uh, uh, with the data hubs and the work that Frank is doing uh, with this uh, caching. That's one reason they're sitting right, like, right one behind the other. <laughs> That's an omen, a good omen, because <laughs> this is a real early moment of opportunity. If we can get these aligned, and I know Alex and, and Frank are, are talking and very interested in this, this will, I think, form the future uh, national research platform uh, distributed data system. And Alex is saying yes, so that's good. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I just want to stop for this. You know, it, it is hard to get how important and transformational this moment is. Because, you know, moments are always like, well, like the last moment or the next moment, how could it be different? 
But there are these differences. I remember as Mosaic was taking off and I was plotting the exponential increase and there were 100 data sites, 100 web servers in the world and, you know, uh, Mark Andreessen, who was a senior working for me at the time doing Mosaic, was writing what's new and reviewing every new website in the world every day and keeping up. There are now tens of millions of pages added to the web every day. There are these moments of takeoff, and we are in one of those moments. And I think having Manish here and talking about the NSF understanding that this is coming, um, it's just incredibly exciting to me to see it happen. Okay, second class that we're seeing happen is high-performance access to remote supercomputers. Now, this is something I've been preaching about um, for 15 years. Back when there was a TerraGrid, I gave the a keynote there, and I said, look, you want, you've got your, your, you know, supercomputer's just a big data generator, and so where are your remote users that have this big data, and wouldn't it make sense to use things back then? It was the Optiputer, uh, but now the PRP or the NRP, to connect those specific users that want to, say, do a lot of analysis on the data that you've got stored way in the supercomputer. Mike Norman did one of these things, uh, Project Stargate, uh, back in 2009 across the country, showed it could be done. It's not being done. So I was so excited yesterday when Chris Paolini, who is um, just an amazing uh, researcher, because he not only has this depth of research in geophysics and chemistry, but also in all of the uh, intricacies of uh, the software systems like uh, Kubernetes. And these are uh, underground reservoir simulations that he's done, but he's distributed the computing across the PRP from San Diego State to UC San Diego, connecting his local cluster with the Comet uh, supercomputer at SDSC, doing MPI and domain composition all within containers across this uh, high-speed connection of two completely different architecture computers. And it's working just fine. And he gave the results and all kinds of stuff yesterday. So I think we're going to see more and more of this. The second example I'll give you of this, of course, is from our friends at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, there's both large-scale, uh, large telescope survey work that goes on, like the Palomar Transient Factory, in which the NERSC supercomputer uh, uh, does this computing. But there's a thousand-node uh, cluster Hyades uh, that sits at Santa Cruz just for astronomers. <laughs> so there's a chance to couple these to do a lot of the detailed you know, work on the on the science at Santa Cruz as the the giant uh, both simulations and here you see of 2D supernovas go on, or the large uh, telescope surveys. Well, scenic as the backplane again for the PRP enabled Shaw Dong, who's sitting here in the front row, uh, one of the NSF funded cyber engineers. Um, to uh, that's a Fiona on the floor there that he's about to rack mount uh, last year. And that uh, linking together between ESNet and Scenic uh, led to uh, their being given the award in, uh, earlier this year at Scenic uh, 2018 for the Innovations and Networking Award for Research Applications. So the idea now is you've, gone, you've now got these tightly coupled systems, one at Santa Cruz, one a supercomputer and uh, Berkeley, uh, and, and so you can just move these very large data sets. It's no longer an issue. If, if you put the data where it needs to be for the scientist, let them do the software work where it needs to be. And Kubernetes makes this automatic. Well, when I was asked by James Deaton, who's in the back row, to uh, come and give uh, the keynote to their annual meeting of the Great Plains Network uh, in Kansas City uh, in May, uh, this is James' map of the uh, all the campuses. Uh, they somehow decided that football symbols or something were important. Jayhawks. I mean, I grew up hating the Jayhawks. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to get into it, but uh, 
you know, the Tigers and the, and the Jayhawks, they just didn't, it goes back to Quantrell and burning down Lawrence and things like that. But anyway, that was 150 years ago, but we don't forget. Uh, anyway, the point is, there are, all these, <laughs> there are all these campuses that the Great Plains Network ties together. Uh, and so I uh, asked, before I went to give the talk, I asked our friends at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, can you give me uh, who are your big, who are your supercomputer users in any of these campuses? Are there any of these campuses that have any? Uh, yes. <laughs> all of those that have squares around them. So all of those are now, this coming year, in the position to begin to think about doing what Santa Cruz did. Right? Or what? Chris has shown could be done at UCs. So, I mean, and this is just the Great Plains network. <clears throat> and a uh, number, Jen, a number of the others are working on uh, getting from all of Exceed, where all of the users are on all of the campuses that are going to be in this pilot. And so I think we finally have a chance to, to make this happen in, a, in sort of a routine way. Okay, the third class uh, is um, the use, this is really an emerging field of science and it's becoming incredibly important for the society. And that's pulling together sensor nets, real-time sensors, including cameras, including meteorological uh, stations and so forth with real-time computing. This is, this is new stuff. So let me give you an example, uh, and one that's very dear to, close to my heart, um, and that's, uh, the wildfires that are ravaging uh, the West uh, right now. So this is uh, one of the HP RIN, the High Performance Wireless Research and Education Networks that NSF patiently invested. Hans Werner Braun uh, led for uh, 12 years, maybe 15 years, uh, to build across San Diego these uh, high, you know, uh, multi-hundred uh, megabits a second, point to point, the mountaintop to mountaintop. Uh, array over the entire county, including all of the East County where uh, a lot of these fires happen. And so they spot these things. In fact, they, within a minute typically of the plume. And then uh, uh, Ilke Altentas, who's the chief data science officer at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, put together a, a NSF grant called Wi-Fi that integrates those together with satellites. Now satellites used to not be able to give you a map of every point <laughs> every day on the Earth, but they do now. Uh, and Planet Lab and places like that have really made a revolution in this. And so uh, this is the Ventura fire last December um, that um, was so destructive. Um, and so this uh, is using the cyber infrastructure I've been describing, and again, in uh, CNEX annual meeting, we're given the uh, Networking uh, Innovations and Networking Award for experimental applications. It's a different category. Um, and you're going to hear more in the deep dive today about HP RIN. Well, how does the PRP fit into this? Well, it turns out that these cameras all go, you know, st these streams are coming in real time, weather streams, uh, images, and everything. They go to server complexes. Well, those servers were separate. There was one at UCSD, there was one at San Diego State, and so on. The PRP now interconnects the backplane. So it's like cellular uh, you know, telephones. Yeah, there's a cell tower, but the cell towers are connected by fiber optics. That's how the system works. And, um, and so, but also we have all of the weather data for the whole country. There's this gigantic fire hose that John Graham tamed, and we bring all that into the PRP, and then that's uh, on the PRP is, the, is Comet, the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Uh, and, and so then Ilkai, who has gotten multiple NSF grants over the years for developing Kepler workflows, has a whole workflow that takes in all these multiple levels of uh, landscape data. You've got to know what the terrain is. You have to know what the land cover is, whether it's going to burn or not burn, It's whether it's developed, paved, or whatever. So all that comes in. Then there's all of the drones and the helicopters and the fixed wing planes, and they're bringing in, looking at where the current, at this moment in time, where is the fire parameter? All that goes into a code called FireSight, which is then run on the supercomputer, and that then turns out the Wi-Fi maps, and those maps are then publicly available, and also showing for the satellites of where the things have burned, there were over a million people that used this site 
in October uh, in the Napa Sonoma fires and then in the fires in um, LA Ventura and uh, San Diego in October and December last year. So this is a whole new capability and then Lewis Fox has been working uh, at Scenic to try to lead a whole collaborative team of people across this state to actually hopefully get this replicated across uh, California because the wireless, the fixed wireless extension of the optical backplane is the logic next step, the logical thing to do, uh, and and we're we're going to need it everywhere, not just in California. Um, so the next thing I'm going to is okay, we've got all this data, we can move it around, we've got science using it. The obvious next step is adding machine learning to that data uh, to get essentially the right and the left brain put together. Now let me give you an example of that. So one of the things that we funded was uh, to take an optical microscope and put it in the water with a fiber optic coming out the end and then into the uh, uh, UCSD network and into the PRP. And what that leads to is one billion images so far in just the last year or two of the of the the, the zooplankton, the the phytoplankton, the diatoms. Now you may not think that these little guys that live in the ocean make any difference, but if you like breathing, if you like breathing, you like breathing, you like oxygen, good good stuff, right? Well, every fifth breath you take was created by these diatoms in the ocean. And, you know, as the CO2 gets higher and higher, which is a fact, it is getting higher and higher, over 400 parts per million now, uh, that gets absorbed. The ocean absorbs most of that CO2, and that makes the ocean more acidic. And these little carbon, carbonate, calcium carbonate critters don't do so well as the, acid, as the ocean gets more acidic. Just think about where that's taking us. So knowing this stuff is really important, and knowing early changes in the ecology, the numerical ecology of this stuff is so important. So what you obviously need is machine learning to do the image analysis of this. You can't just give it to graduate students, not at a billion images. And so they're using these Fiona's for the image processing, but that includes also this particle tracking of lost similar. I won't get into all the details, but it's very computationally intensive, and uh, it's the sort of thing that requires dedicated uh, GPUs as well as the CPUs we've been talking about. Well, so that's why, and again, I didn't, couldn't talk about this last year because it hadn't happened. A different set of us were, uh, put together a, uh, a proposal that the NSF funded, uh, which is to build a uh, machine learning on top of the uh, PRP uh, using 32-bit um, uh, uh, GPUs. So the uh, GPUs that are available typically in the cloud or in the uh, Exceed uh, resources are, are double precision, 64-bit, quite a bit more expensive. These are the gaming GPUs that 50 or 60 million NVIDIA ships a, a year. Turns out that they're just fine for most machine learning, and so we're going to get 256 of these GPUs. What we did is Unlike the PRP, we went around and looked for the application scientist. What we did is we went and looked at a subset of uh, the universities involved, 10 of them, to get the computer scientist and the and machine learning algorithm developers, of which we have 30 now that have their research to, in this proposal. And uh, then we're going to sprinkle the GPUs, we've already started on this, in eight per, um, uh, uh, eight, eight of them per, uh, Fiona, and uh, Vincat is going to talk about machine learning and, and, and science uh, in the deep dive tomorrow. And here's just the Fiona's with uh, eight of these. They're, of course, uh, multi-tenant con containerized, and that includes uh, Jupiter, so all the notebook stuff is co automatically containerized and part of this uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, cluster. Uh, and just to give you an example of what this has done in one year, uh, a year ago we really didn't have any GPUs on the UCSD campus. But using these Fiona's, Frank uh, was able to work with me and with Mike Norman at SDSC to put 48 of these GPUs for applications. 
the sun cave that Tom Defani and um, his team developed actually has 70 of these GPUs at connect, interconnected at 40 gigabits a second running the cave, but most of the time nobody's looking at the cave. So it becomes this amazing machine learning device. And we actually had professors in machine learning at Irvine teaching courses that the NIH had funded on machine learning and healthcare. They didn't have GPUs up at Irvine. They just came down over the PRP and used these for their, for their course, and it worked just great. Um, uh, the Chase CI will put 96 of those more. And then, and this is something that all of you who are on campuses need to be thinking about. Where are your students going to be able to get access to these GPUs and to do hands-on uh, work? Um, yep. Yes, dear. Okay, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, just, just finishing. Um, uh, and so then Common itself has uh, 64 of these. So what we're doing is uh, putting around this, using Kubernetes, reaching out to the NSF clouds and Cloud Lab, and Chameleon are both here, uh, to the 64-bit GPUs, to the ones in the cloud like Amazon, uh, our friends in Japan who built uh, 4,000 of these 64-bit GPUs into their machine learning supercomputer. And then the non-von Neumann uh, accelerators for machine learning, like the TPUs uh, at, um, at Google, uh, the FPGAs that are at Microsoft, but also at uh, the Texas Advanced uh, Computing Center. Uh, there's uh, uh, 384 of them. Uh, the IBM True North, uh, Pattern Computing is a new one. So there's talks by the NSF Clouds, by Google, by Amazon here. So my last slide uh, is that we're then setting up uh, uh, labs both at uh, UC San Diego and UC Irvine that are looking at not just deep learning multi-layer neural nets, but eight different categories of machine learning algorithms, support vector machines, Boltzmann machines, and so forth, and how those map onto all these architectures, which it will be a part of this community resource uh, that is going to be available uh, to both al al algorithm developers as well as application folks. So that's it. Um, there's an amazing amount that's changed, but we're just at the beginning of really prototyping this national research platform uh, and how it is going to change not only this country, but the world. Thanks. Thanks.